Welcome to the Purely Podcast. I'm your host, Alicia Pope, health coach, wellness expert. You can consider me your online bestie too. Imagine we're having a green juice together or a glass of wine for that matter. I believe in wellness that empowers you and lifts you up. On this podcast, you can expect a 360 degree view of wellness. But remember, there's no perfect when it comes to our health. It's whatever works for us. With that, let's dive in. Enjoy. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Purely Podcast. This episode, we are chatting with Lindsay Lesson, who is a registered dietitian who specializes in disordered eating and infertility. She has both personal and professional experience with hypothalamic amenorrhea, that is a mouthful, HA, or period loss related to overexercise and under eating. Her experience led her to become passionate about educating and empowering others to advocate for their health and take charge of their fertility through proper nutrition. She's helped dozens of women recover natural cycles, get pregnant, and heal their relationship with food and exercise along the way. This is a topic that I think needs to be talked about so much more, fertility and infertility, and the correlation between severe dieting, eating disorders, and infertility. And Lindsay is doing just that. It seems like such a niche, but I think that it's something that so many women deal with. It's just not spoken about enough. And Lindsay is very, very, very knowledgeable on all of these items and how you can truly get your fertility back. So if infertility is something that you are struggling with, if HA is something that you're struggling with, if not getting your period is something that you are struggling with, if you have irregular periods, I think this episode will be so informational for you. And also it might be some information that you haven't heard before because a lot of the things that Lindsay was talking about I hadn't heard before. So I think that will be really good. And if you are struggling with infertility, then this is definitely something you want to listen to. Or even if you are wanting to optimize fertility and you might start start trying to get pregnant soon, then this is definitely something I would recommend listening to. We talk through Lindsay's personal fertility and ED journey and how she got here, the correlation between ED and fertility, why not having a period isn't normal and and red flags to look out for that you may be hearing from your doctor, aka that it is normal because it's totally not. What HA is and the root causes of it, the three reasons that are stopping women from getting their period, Lindsay's exact approach to getting your period back and fertility back in order, tips for dealing with the mental health piece of fertility, and of course, the best way to track your fertility once you actually do have your regular period back. So, so much good information. You guys are going to absolutely love this episode. And before we dive in, I would love to give you my health coaching tip of the day. And this is definitely a tip that I have given before, but I think it's a really good reminder, and that is to be your own health advocate. And the reason why I've given it before and why I've said it so many times is because it's so important. Lindsay and I discuss it a little bit in this episode, but if you are working with a doctor and something just feels off to you, there is nobody that knows your body better than you, right? And if somebody is telling you that is normal, that you don't have a period, then again, that that is not necessarily a good answer, right? So there it's, it's not normal. And there are ways to treat it outside of just hormonal birth control, which doesn't actually give you a true period or fertility treatments. So, you know, I think that just being your own advocate and finding an approach and direction and route that works for you is really, really important. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with fertility treatments, you know, but I think that, there's something wrong with misinformation and with not necessarily knowing that there is another route, right? So I think this episode will be very informational for all of you guys, and I can't wait for you to listen. So without further ado, please help me welcome Lindsay Lesson to the Purely Podcast. Hi, Lindsay. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. I am so excited because I feel like this is a topic that needs to be discussed so much more. But to start off, can you give the audience a little bit of a background on who you are, what you do, and also how did you end up doing what you're doing and with the specialty too? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a registered dietitian and I specialize in disordered eating and infertility. The reason why I specialize in this is because this is something that I have a long history with. So I struggled with disordered eating and eating disorder. And during that time, I also lost my period. And so I was always on hormonal hormonal birth control to get a withdrawal bleed. I was told that was kind of the solution to my problem, but it was always in the back of my mind, like, okay, what do I do when I'm ready to have kids though? And so when that time came, instead of, well, I was kind of given a choice of like fertility treatment or well, not or really a whole lot else. So then I kind of started doing a lot of independent research, um, learned about a condition known as hypokalemic amenorrhea, which we'll just call AJ because that's a mouthful. Um, and I really learned about how it's related to not properly fueling your body. And that's why your body shuts down your period. And that was exactly what was going on with me. Um, so through, you know, kind of a year of healing, I was able to get pregnant naturally. I actually have two kids now. Um, and just really kind of found a passion for helping other women do the same thing. There's not a lot of information out there. There aren't a lot of supportive positions, unfortunately, um, just what I've learned. And so that's why people come to me is for more support. That's amazing. I love that. Can you explain a little bit? Because I know that you educate a lot on both of these topics, but can you explain a little bit how like the food freedom and the disordered eating might be linked to fertility, like how the two are intertwined and, and how they correlate and why they are kind of important to, to discuss together as well? Yeah. So the heart of HA is an underfueling issue. So often what I see in women that are struggling with this is that they just simply aren't allowing themselves en- enough food. And this can manifest in so many different ways. It can be somebody who's really into calorie or macro counting, or it could be somebody who just simply um, wants to eat really clean and they kind of just take it too far. So you can unknowingly be under eating and that just doesn't give your body the right message. It begins to kind of shut down unnecessary body systems, right? Like we need to be able to um, breathe oxygen and we need to, our heart needs to be able to pump blood to vital organs, right? Like those are essential body processes, but having your period, that's something that we can live without. And so in an effort to conserve energy, your body shuts down your menstrual cycle. Um, And that's what happens when people aren't getting their period with HA. Got it. Okay. So that makes sense. What are some of the other root causes of HA? Is it, and also too, like with that, because I know you said the under eating, under fueling, and also with that, like how does your response to HA differ from the traditional Western medicine response to HA? Cause like you said, you had your own experience with it and they're like, okay, well just fertility treatments or, you know, here, go on birth control to get your period, which that's also not what's happening when you're going on birth control either. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So what contributes to HA is it's three main things. It's um, under eating, it's over exercising, and it's stress. A lot of people who experience HA are also just high performing type A individuals. They thrive in stressful environments, or at least they think they thrive in stressful environments. Um, So there are multiple things that kind of contribute to it. But at the heart, it's simply not eating enough food for the amount of exercise you're doing, maybe maintaining a body weight that's too low for you or body fat percentage that's too lean for you. The approach to treating it from a Western medicine perspective, in my opinion, is inadequate because nine out of 10 physicians are going to put you on the pill. They're just going to be like, you know what? Getting your, not getting your period isn't healthy. Um, so we're going to give you your period by giving you a fake withdrawal bleed and telling you to go on the pill. And depending upon your goal at the time, if you're trying to get pregnant, then they're just going to point you to fertility treatment, which may or may not work. I've definitely seen people be able to get pregnant without a period. Um, but I've also seen people really struggle with fertility treatment and not responding. Um, because again, they just simply aren't filling their bodies properly. So my approach differs because I address the root cause, right? Like you're not eating enough. Let's talk about why that is. Do you have a lot of internalized fat phobia? Do you have a lot of fear of foods? Are you simply afraid to eat certain foods because you feel like they're bad for you? They're going to impact your digestion. They're going to make you fat. We really start talking about why it's hard for these women to eat enough and to fill their bodies properly. I also see a lot of exercise addiction in women that are struggling with HA. So it's also like, 
why can you not rest? Like, why is it so hard for you to take a rest day? Rest is healthy. Um, and then also lowering a lot of stress. Again, you know, a lot of these women struggling with this are struggling with fear around weight gain or fear around eating quote bad foods. And so by helping them to learn and accept that all foods can be good and nourishing for fertility, we help lower the stress around going out to eat with your significant other or being able to let somebody else cook for you or just grabbing a donut on Saturday morning because it sounds good. So we lower the stress and anxiety around food. And that's another thing that's really pivotal for helping women recover their periods to be able to get pregnant. What is your approach for that? Like, are there certain tools that you're, is it just merely education around it? Like, look, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. Um, Or are there certain tools that you give people like different mindset shifts just around that stress with adding in? Because I'm sure that like fat phobia is something that is so deeply rooted and food fears are so deeply rooted. And I'm sure that it's like, okay, well, if you want this, you have to do this sort of thing like that, like TikTok and like Instagram, you know, it's like, so you want this, but okay, well then you're going to have to do this. Um, but what are some of like the tools that you work with? Cause I'm sure that it's so much more than just, okay, like here's what you eat. Like, I'm sure there's such a huge mental piece of it as well that you have to work with your clients on. Yeah, a hundred percent because information only gets you so far, right? Like if you can have all the information in the world, but if you don't have the support direction, guidance and accountability, you know, you're probably not gonna have a lot of success with applying the information. So that's where my group coaching program comes in. So I run group coaching, about 10 to 15 women that are, you know, struggling with this issue. And we meet weekly, we have um, coaching calls. And we really talk through what everyone is struggling with. And we also kind of, I like to play the why game. Whenever somebody's struggling with like a fear food or a disorder of thought about their body, I like to ask them why. Like, where did that come from? Why do you believe that to be true? And we go really, really deep into why we believe these things, why that's not true, and start, you know, working on replacing our negative thoughts with neutral or positive thoughts about our body or about food. And time and repetition, honestly, are like the biggest things. Um, Staying connected to a supported group, I can't tell you how powerful it is to have something that maybe you've struggled with your entire life that maybe you haven't told a lot of people and to finally say things out loud and then to see 10 other people say, yeah, me too. Like I'm scared of that too. And I'm dealing with this too, but I want to change and I'm here and I'm going to do it with you. So I think the group supportive environment and again, talking, exposing really the roots at some of those fears is huge. And then having accountability with actually doing something about it. Right. So we set weekly goals. We're checking in every single week. And these women are making progress on not only getting their period back, but improving their relationship with food in their body. Let's take a brief break to chat about Purely You, aka your new home for becoming the best version of you. It is my on demand, body loving Pilates and motivational health coaching subscription. And if you haven't checked it out yet, you definitely need to. For this month in July, I just released a monthly calendar. Calendar, so you will have body loving movements, Pilates movements set out for you to do every single day for the month of July, each day in the week, Monday through Friday, and then also a self-care Sunday idea on the calendar. And of course, Saturday and Sunday are kind of like active rest days for you to listen to your body. But of course, for every single day, you know your body best and you can follow whatever you need and take a break whenever you need as well. But along with the calendar, there is also a habit tracker. So there is a downloadable calendar with the habit tracker so you can check off exactly what you've done throughout the week, track your habits. You can track the body loving Pilates, you can track the health coaching, or you can track any new habits that you're working on. And then the other thing that I'm so excited to share with you guys is that this month on the platform, we are discussing food freedom and intuitive eating. So so you know that this is one of my biggest passion points, one of the things that I coach a majority of my one-on-one clients on. And it's something that I believe is truly so important, something that everybody could benefit from. So there are four weeks of health coaching videos on food freedom and intuitive eating with my top tips that I give my one-on-one clients, as well as self-work, which I'm calling the homework for you to really move forward in your food freedom journey, as well as resources underneath each video. 
So those videos are included in the calendar as well. So lots of fun things happening over at Purely You. So definitely check it out and claim your seven day free trial today. The link is in the show notes, or you can also head to purelypope.com and claim your free trial today. All right, let's get back to the show. Which is great. And I think that what you mentioned in terms of seeing that other people are struggling with it too, because I think that fertility in general, and also like the disordered eating, I think it's two topics that aren't talked about enough and they're almost taboo to talk about. So I think that you're right. Like you hit the nail on the head that the community and just understanding that other people are dealing with this too. But then also like you were talking about of kind of like debunking the thoughts, so to speak, I think is so powerful and just kind of going like, okay, but why, but why, but why? And like continuing to peel back the onion and like peel back the layers and seeing like where those thoughts came from, whether it's diet culture or whether it's, you know, something that you heard when you were younger and it just kind of stuck, you know, cause it's like so much of this stuff. It's like, it takes a lot of unlearning, which is really important. And something that you mentioned recently that I wanted to ask you about in terms of unlearning is you mentioned on your um, Instagram about refined carbs being good for recovery, because I think that a lot of times, um, and recovery of getting your period back in and fertility and all of that, because I think a lot of times people, they have, especially in the wellness industry, I think there's so many things that are labeled bad or labeled good or, you know, in these like general categories. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about refined carbs and maybe like taking the demonization away from those refined carbs and giving everybody that's listening the information of why those might be exactly what you need to add in if you're struggling with fertility issues. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that a really great way to identify diet culture or even wellness culture is whenever somebody takes a statement and takes it to an extreme, right? To say that all refined carbohydrates are bad for every single person under all circumstances is such a black and white untrue statement, right? Now, eating refined carbohydrates when someone's missing their period, they're trying to get their period back and get pregnant is beneficial for two main reasons. Now, we actually have science and research that supports that our brain. So um, when we lose our period, there's an area in our brain, your hypothalamus, that shuts down hormone production. In order for that area in your brain to sense that it has enough calories, enough energy to flip back on and start producing hormones, it needs to sense a certain amount of glucose which is what carbohydrates break down to into, into our body. And so because refined carbohydrates break down so quickly in our body, we can get a faster glucose response and a faster insulin response. And that can help with turning your hypothalamus back on, essentially leading to ovulation and you getting your period. So very high level scientific reason why refined carbohydrates are actually beneficial for recovery. And then the second one comes down to digestion. So many times I see people trying to eat more food, but only trying to eat clean foods. So they're eating a ton of fruits, a ton of vegetables, a ton of beans, a ton of um, um, complex carbohydrates, high fiber foods. And that can be really uncomfortable because as we know, high fiber foods don't break down as quickly by the body. And so if you're eating a ton of those, then you can feel really bloated, really sluggish, really just uncomfortably full. So eating refined carbohydrates is going to actually help your body to process through those things quicker. You're going to have less digestive issues. So again, two, two big reasons why refined carbs are actually helpful. That makes sense. And I didn't know that about like the part of your brain switching off and that's what's going to trigger it to switch back on. I think the information that you're sharing is so important for women to hear. And something else that you mentioned too is having a minimum of 2,500 calories, um, which I think that for a lot of women... I think it's probably like, oh my God, wait, what? Like, especially if they have been ingrained in diet culture, you know, they're like, wait, how am I even going to do that? Can, so can you explain maybe like the scientific reason behind that as well? And just like from an RD's perspective of why that's important to really increase that much. And also maybe how you deal with that fear of weight gain when somebody is increasing that the calories, you know, like say they're eating like 2000 calories or 1500 calories, or maybe they're way, they were way under eating and they're at like 1200 calories, you know? Like, how do you kind of address that? And also what's the reason for that too? This is probably one of the biggest things I think that 
people kind of get scared of when they learn about the recovery process. If someone comes from a calorie counting background, 2,500 calories can seem like a lot of food. This number is also backed by research. So if anyone is looking to recover their period, one of the best resources, in my opinion, is the book, No Period, Now What? And that's where the 2,500 calories comes from. So this number was based off of three different research studies that found about an average amount of food that an active woman with a healthy regular ovulatory menstrual cycle is consuming. Um, and so that number was basically extrapolated to say, hey, this is your baseline. This is where you need to be to be eating a period, to be getting a period. Most women that have lost their period are not eating that amount of food. Um, so if you're a calorie counter, and like your, to your point, like if you're used to eating 1500 calories, that number itself can be really scary. So the way that I support people in overcoming that is I don't have them count calories. We take all the numbers out of the equation, actually have a different method that focuses on um, eating three meals and three snacks, addressing their food roles, and making sure that you have each of the macronutrients, carbohydrate, protein, and fat at your meals and snacks. Because oftentimes I find that people... Part of the reason why they're not eating enough is because they're not eating carbs, or maybe they're really limited on their fats. And so I think that not obsessing about the numbers is really helpful in helping people recover. And then, of course, the other thing that scares people about recovery is the weight gain process. That's really scary. I mean, it is. Like the culture that we live in reinforces that thinner is better, that weight gain is bad. And so that's a lot of mindset work. One of the biggest tips I give my clients, though, in overcoming that fear is to not weigh yourself. So again, I, my practice is very non-numbers focused because numbers can be really triggering. A lot of the people I'm working with have eating disorders or, or, or borderline eating disorders. And so moving away from like compulsive habits like that can be really helpful for recovery. I think that's a really good point of, of removing those numbers and just kind of focusing on the method, right? And focusing on, okay, like this is how we're going to get here. We're not going to look at like all the, the science of it because I think you're right. The numbers can be really triggering. I would love for you to expand a little bit um, in terms of the scale and why that might not be helpful with body image and fertility. Cause I know that you've spoken on that before as well. Um, and maybe just talking about why that maybe is something that you should remove if you're struggling with both of these things and trying to get your period back, trying to overcome food fears, some things like that. Like, can you speak on that a little bit? Yeah, so two things kind of come to mind when I talk about why I don't recommend weighing in recovery. One of the things that I find that people get so frustrated about is that they say, well, I'm at a healthy weight for my body. My doctor says my weight is fine. According to the BMI chart, I'm normal and I'm healthy. And I think it can hold people back in thinking that my weight doesn't need to change because I'm at a healthy weight. Well, HA can actually occur at any woman in any body size, even if she's slightly overweight, you know, it's, again, it's simply an under fueling issue, simply a stress and over exercise issue. And so weight is kind of irrelevant. So in that approach, I don't feel like it's helpful to think like, you know, if, if you, if you're getting hung up on weight, you know, weighing yourself regularly, isn't really helpful in recovery. Like you're probably going to have to gain weight, but I've never had a client continue to weigh herself, see that number go up every single week and think, oh, I'm so motivated. Like this process is so worth it. No, like usually that scares the crap out of people. And so again, taking a trigger away is really helpful. And then also a lot of the people that I work with get really obsessed with the number on the scale, like to the point where if it's up a pound or two, it ruins their whole week. It also drives them to restrict and over-exercise. And so weight is a huge trigger for disordered eating. I think it's really helpful, even if you feel like you have a healthy relationship with the scale, to not weigh yourself very often and to also understand that our weight fluctuates, changes over time, especially during different seasons of life, whether you've moved across the country, you are working a lot more and just don't have enough time for physical activity, or you're pregnant, you're postpartum, you're going through some sort of hormonal or health issue, um, and to recognize that weight's not the stagnant number, it's going to change. But if you're at this place where you're clinging to a number on the scale that's too low and unhealthy for you, it's not helpful to look at that number and have that fear reinforced every single day that your body's changing if that's your biggest fear. 
I completely agree. And also there's so much more than just the number on the scale, right? It's like, like 120 pounds versus 120 pounds can be so many different things, you know, it's like in somebody's specific body, you know? So I think that that's like something that's so important to realize as well is that there's so many differences as well that like the scale doesn't tell you that just using weight as a metric isn't necessarily giving you the whole story either, which I think is important. Um, but going back a little bit, so you mentioned over exercising, and I would love to speak about this. So we've talked a little bit about the nutrition piece of all of it, of people hold like of what's holding people back from getting their period, from having fertility, and all that sort of thing. But what does over exercising look like? And is there a specific type of exercise that people are doing that's not serving their them? Is there a specific type of exercise that you recommend? I would love to hear like the thoughts on that as well. Yeah. So over exercise is kind of subjective, right? Because what might be too much exercise for me may not be too much exercise for you or vice versa, right? What it comes down to is the amount that you're doing and the amount that you're eating. Now, the type of exercise we typically see period loss with is lots of high intensity exercise. So maybe you're riding your Peloton for 60 to 90 minutes every single day. Maybe you're training for a half marathon or a marathon. Um, maybe you're into CrossFit or doing a lot of high intensity interval training. So really anything that is considered to, considered to be high impact, high intensity is usually the exercise that we see with period loss. Although I have worked with people that just simply are under fueling and they're walking like 15 to 20,000 steps per day. So I would say there's not a particular exercise that leads to period loss. Again, it's really just the mismatch in the amount of food you're allowing yourself and the amount of movement that you're doing. Is there a specific type of exercise, say if somebody, maybe it is kind of a combination of the under fueling as well as the like over exercising piece. Is there a specific type of exercise that you normally recommend like is does it have to do with any sort of like the hormones too it's like where certain exercises are super cortisol inducing or anything like that or not really so from the perspective of recovering your period yes there's exercises that i recommend not doing so uh, you mentioned cortisol that is part of the reason why your body isn't cycling is because it's chronically stressed out and when our bodies are stressed and kind of like with the under fueling our body sense that they start shutting down unnecessary body processes. And so part of the recovery process is to bring cortisol levels down. In order to do that, we have to stop exercising so much. And the fastest, most efficient way to do that is to cut out all high intensity exercise. So I really don't recommend people getting their heart rate really above the 120 beat per minute mark. We actually have research that shows that anything that gets your heart rate above the 100 beat per minute mark, which is most stuff, um, does elicit that cortisol response. So from a recovery perspective, absolutely, I would not recommend doing high intensity exercise if you're working on getting your period back. That's good information to know. And then the other thing that you mentioned was stress. So how do you recommend somebody to minimize stress? Because I think that if you're dealing with infertility, if you're dealing with not having your period, the whole scenario, just those two facts, I feel like could be really stressful, right? Especially if you're trying to get pregnant and you haven't been able to, I'm sure that like that's stressful in and of itself, but I'm sure there's other external factors that are going on. So are there any tools that you recommend to clients to help minimize stress or do you have a certain protocol that you go about to start to minimize those stress levels and stress on the body? I know that like the exercising and the food have to do with it, but are there any other areas that you're looking at as well? Yeah. So everybody's going to have stressors in their lives, right? Like the goal isn't let's eliminate all stressors from our lives forever and ever, but we can't talk about healthy ways to cope with stress. So what I usually do is I have clients take an assessment. What are your top stressors? A lot of times it's exercise, even though we may not recognize it. A lot of times we think, oh, like exercise, that's not stressful. That's my stress relief. It can be to a certain extent, but when you're exercising for two hours a day, every single day, you're not allowing your body to rest and recuperate. Um, so eliminating as much stress as we can from phys physical stress from exercise, working through fear foods, disordered habits, uh, stress around food is a biggie. And then if you have external factors, let's say you've got a lot of family stress or your job is really stressful or I don't know, everyone's going to have stressors, right? Are there things that you can delegate? Are there things that you can take off your plate? 
If not, let's focus on a healthy stress management plan. What are your outlets? Who do you talk to about your stress? How do you de-stress? Are you focusing on self-care? Are you doing it regularly? So we put together a custom stress management plan for each client, depending upon what their stressors are, what their ability to manage their stress looks like, and what is practical for that person in that situation. Got it. So kind of taking an inventory of like, okay, what's going on here? Do you recommend any tools such as like meditation or anything like that too? Or is it kind of custom depending on each client as well of like what's going to work with them? Definitely depends on the client, right? Because I can say, go meditate. Someone can be like, I don't know how to meditate. That's not helpful. So things that I found that have been helpful, you know, meditation, prayer, journaling, self-care activities, getting massages, acupuncture, going for mani-pedi, getting a blowout, you know, like everybody is going to recharge and regenerate in different ways. So I do think that having a list of things can be helpful, but each person's probably going to take their two to three that really work for them. Okay, everybody, let's take a brief break to chat about the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. In case you're not familiar, it is exactly where I went to school to become a health coach. And I couldn't be more obsessed with the school. I actually did a whole episode on how I became a health coach, why tips for building your business, which I will link in the show notes. But also right now, IAN is offering a sample course that you can take. So you can take it completely for free and see what the school is all about. So if you are passionate about health and wellness, if you are looking to transform your own health and also maybe even transforming your career, then I would say that IAN is definitely for you. I was so passionate about my career for a while, but then it came up to the time that I wasn't. And IAN has been instrumental in transforming my life, but also too, I obviously have now built a business on becoming a health coach, but I always say that going through IAN was almost like being coached myself because I transformed so much through the principles that I learned at IAN. And what's really cool is that you can take the courses, you can take the school from anywhere in the world on your own device. It's all online, but you get to learn from over 85 of the world's top experts in the health and wellness space, including Deepak Chopra, Andrew Weil, Gabby Bernstein, Mark Hyman, and so, so many more. And then you actually get, get to become a accredited professional from the original and largest nutrition and health coaching school in the world. Trust me, you will not regret this take the sample course. If you're interested in learning more, if anything, if you're interested in health, which I know that you are, since you're listening to this podcast, you will totally enjoy taking this course just for fun. So I will link it in the show notes for you to try out and let's get back to the show. In terms of like the timeline of all of this, when you start working with a client, how long, and I mean, I'm sure that it's different, but like if somebody say they were going to like implement all of your protocols immediately and they were going to follow everything that you tell them to do, which I know it's like, I'm a health coach. I'm like, I know that clients don't do that right away. You know, it's like, it takes a journey, but, um, it's great if they do, but it's, of course, it's like little changes make a big difference. And I think that that's how it's like, they'll kind of stick, but, um, what does the timeline typically look like? Like what can, how long will it take somebody to get their period back? Is it like a six month thing? Is it a year long thing? Can it be quicker than that? Like, what does that typically look like? So for my clients who are really following my method, they're doing everything that I recommend. Average recovery time is about two months. I pretty rarely have anyone that takes longer than three months. There's always going to be outliers, right? Like I have people that start my program, they get their period back in two weeks. And then some people are going to take closer to three or four months. Um, but two, two months is the average recovery time. And I'll also argue that if someone's taking longer than three months to get their period back, they need some tweaks to their recovery plan. They're probably not doing everything right. And when that, when they get their period back, are they immediately able to start trying to get pregnant after that? Yeah, they absolutely can. I've even had clients, um, because some of my clients who are trying to conceive, um, they're really into cycle tracking and they're able to catch their first ovulation and even get pregnant before their first period, period recovery period comes. 
Wow. That's really cool. How do you recommend tracking? Like, so like when somebody does, um, get their period back, how do you recommend with your clients to track fertility? Is that something that you help with them? Cause I know that there's so many different ways. And of course, I know that you're probably not the biggest fan of hormonal birth control, like, you know, and of course with these people, they're not necessarily trying that since they're trying to get pregnant, but how do you recommend that somebody tracks their fertility? Maybe whether they're like trying to get pregnant or not either. Um, is there like a method that you prefer? I know that there's so many different ones out there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, fertility awareness method is great. If pregnancy is not your goal, because most people who haven't had their period in a while, they don't necessarily know their body and their cycles and incredibly predictable. I recommend having backup forms of birth control, whether you want to use condoms um, or you want to consider having a non-hormonal IUD, something like that. Um, Because fertility awareness method is wonderful, but it's not foolproof if you don't know your body and your cycles are incredibly predictable. But for my clients that are trying to conceive, we, I encourage them to track three main things, cervical mucus patterns, use ovulation predictor kit strips, which you're going to predict your LH surge right before ovulation. Um, And then either basal body temperature tracking, or um, there's a company called Pru that tests for PDG, which is a progesterone metabolite, and it translates over into adequate progesterone levels. So using either basal body temperature tracking or the Prove strips can help with confirming ovulation and then paying attention to cervical mucus changes and using OPKs can help you predict ovulation, which is really important because you want to have sex before you ovulate if you want to get pregnant. And then with that, with the basal body temperature tracking, can you explain a little bit about that? It's like, is your body temp your body temperature is De- increasing before you ovulate or is it decreasing? Like, can you just tell everybody about that if they're not maybe familiar with like the changes in the body and maybe how to measure that? Yeah. So basal body temperature tracking gets a little bit hairy, but it's also probably the, the cheapest and easiest thing that anyone can do to confirm that they have ovulated. So it's important that you check your temperature first thing in the morning before you get out of bed. So literally thermometer on your nightstand, your alarm clock goes off, thermometer goes in your mouth, you report your temperature. So before you ovulate, we usually see um, your temperature is a little bit lower, kind of in the 96s, maybe very low 97s. And then after you ovulate, you'll see a spike. And we want to see a spike of at least um, about a half a degree. And we want it to stay elevated for at least three days. Ideally, temperature should be elevated until your period comes. So if you look at it on a chart and we think about all these temperatures and like, you know, kind of the the line graph, you should see a very distinct change in your pre and post ovulatory temperatures. And that's how you confirm ovulation with basal body temperature tracking. Got it. I just learned about this um, kind of recently and I have an aura ring and I like was comparing it to like where the app that I track my, um, my like fertility and like ovulation and all those sorts of things. And I was like, whoa, that's crazy. And it actually did the aura ring. And it's like, of course the apps aren't going to be like completely accurate with like your ovulation, but I was like, oh, it was like a day or two off. But I noticed of like the day that it was started going down and then the day that it started going up. Um, and it's just really interesting. It's like the more information that we can know about our body, the more empowered that we can be, um, with all of this, but in terms of tracking, is there an app that you recommend? Like, I know you mentioned, um, the, the, the body temperature, but is there an app that you recommend for when somebody starts to get their period back, um, and to start tracking fertility, or is there a different method that you recommend to start tracking that too, once they're back to having a regular period? I think there's a lot of really great free apps. Flow is good. I think um, Femometer is one, and they even sell like a um, thermometer that that will sync with it. And it's funny you mentioned the Aura Ring. The wearables have gotten really popular now. And so if somebody has like a really weird sleep schedule, maybe they work nights, or maybe they just, you know, go to bed at different times and wake at different times, some of those wearables can be a really better predictable way than just using a thermometer for basal body temperature tracking. Very cool. Great. Thank you for those recommendations. Um, And then kind of just going back to the granular, just to kind of really educate everybody so that they know in terms of the things of like what their doctor might be telling them. I know that you 
had a similar experience to this of a doctor telling you like you're perfectly healthy without a period and you know like you're going to do fertility treatment to have a baby and it's completely normal to not have a period can you talk about that and why that might be cause for alarm and maybe to like get a new doctor if they say that it's normal not to have a period um just educating people on that piece a little bit i think that anytime you hear something from a doctor that sounds off to you always get a second opinion I would love to believe that every single doctor now would not say the things that I was told probably almost 10 years ago at this point, but I still hear it. And so if a doctor is telling you that, you know, your period, your missing period isn't a big deal, just go on the pill, you need a new doctor because... There are doctors who know that that's not normal. And there are doctors, maybe not necessarily conventional Western medicine doctors, but there are some really good like functional medicine doctors, um, some naturopathic doctors, not naturopathic physicians, you know, kind of get and are more likely to diagnose HA. So, you know, if you're working with a doctor who is telling you that a missing period is normal and the only answer they're giving you is um, birth control or fertility treatment, just go get a second opinion. There are good doctors out there, but unfortunately there are a lot of doctors who are uneducated on what HA is. And even the ones who know what it is, they have a really hard time diagnosing it because there's a big stigma that it only happens in people who are inpatient for an eating disorder, like anorexic and very underweight or in like Olympic level athletes. And it can happen to anyone in between those extremes. And so um, getting a second opinion, I think is really helpful. And also just advocating for yourself. If you're listening to this podcast or you're reading up on HA and you really feel like that's you and you can't get a doctor to agree, share information, share research at the very least, your doctor should listen to you because regardless of all of the medical training and expertise that they have, you are the expert in your own body. Nobody knows your body better than you do. That's really good advice and a great reminder. It's like if something is feeling off, then it probably is. And you have to listen to your gut and continue to seek out people. And especially too, it's like if you want to try to get pregnant naturally as well, and that's something that's really a goal of yours and you don't want to do the fertility treatments because I know too, it's like fertility treatments aren't cheap. You know, it's like, that's another thing as well is that I think that for a lot of women that might be very overwhelming to even think about that because it's not something that's super affordable either. So thank you for covering that. And so I think that will be really helpful for anybody. Can you tell me the differences between like, I've heard a lot about PCOS as well. Um, and I think that has to do with irregular periods too. So can you talk about maybe the differences between HA and PCOS? PCOS? And do you work with women that have PCOS? Because I know that um, sometimes it's like they'll have problems with fertility as well. Yeah, yeah. So no, I don't work with PCOS. There are a lot of great dietitians who do those. So if you know anyone has any questions, they can DM me and I can send them some references. So a part of the problem with it is the way that PCOS is diagnosed. So it's based out of you having to have two out of three of the following an irregular or missing period, elevated androgens, and not ovulating. Well, if somebody's not ovulating and they're not getting their period, they could, you know, maybe fit the criteria for PCOS from a clinical perspective. And so a lot of these women are getting misdiagnosed. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of the um, ways that we manage PCOS aren't helpful for AJ, right? For telling people to exercise, to watch what they eat, and to lose weight. They're actually going to be making their HA worse if they do that. And so PCOS is very different. It's a very different disease. And again, this isn't my area of expertise, but my most broad understanding is that because of the elevated androgens, um, sometimes insulin resistance can occur. Insulin resistance is usually very common with PCOS. So that's another way that you could probably distinguish is ask your doctor to test you for insulin resistance rather than just assuming that you have it. Um, And because of the insulin resistance, women have trouble ovulating. And sometimes that can lead to irregular cycles or like, I guess in more severe cases, their cycle completely shutting down. So again, they can look really similarly, but what's actually going on in the body and causing PCOS versus HA is very different. Yeah. And that's kind of crazy that clinically they can look 
so similar, like can be diagnosed by those things. And then it's like, okay, the treatment for it is completely opposite of how you are healing and curing HA. Um, So that's really interesting. So if somebody isn't seeing maybe results and they are treating PCOS and aren't aren't seeing any successful results and haven't been tested for that third criteria or anything like that, then maybe that's something for them to look into and get more testing and kind of look deeper into and see if maybe, maybe it's not that maybe it is HA after all. One of the other things, sorry, I misspoke with the how PCOS di- is diagnosed is obviously they're looking for polycystic ovaries, meaning that there are multiple cysts on your ovaries. Well, when somebody isn't getting their cycle, um, they're not getting their period, if their hormone levels are high enough to sort of, you know, be going through some sort of hormonal cycle, they can grow a follicle and then they, the follicle won't quite get to maturation to where they would actually ovulate and then it dies back. And that's what creates the cyst. So women with HA can have, quote, polycystic ovaries, but it doesn't necessarily mean they have PCOS. Oh, interesting. Got it. That's another like really crazy thing to note as well, which is so helpful. Well, Lindsay, this has been so informational. And I think that what you're doing and like just really the niche and specialization is so needed. And your account is just such a wealth of knowledge, like what you're sharing and you're helping so many people. So thank you so much for being here. I do add my podcast with a question and it is revolving around self-love and what does self-love mean to you? Yeah, I think self-love means just being confident in who you are at your core, uh, not necessarily because of the way that you look or because things that you, that you have accomplished in your life, but just being completely okay with yourself and also just having grace with yourself and understanding that you're human, you're going to make mistakes, mistakes, you don't have to do everything perfectly. And just being able to be confident in who you are as a person. I think having the grace for yourself is huge. So where can everybody find you? How can they work with you? Where can they go to find more information? Tell them all the things where they can find you. So I'm most active on Instagram and you can find me at food.freedom.fertility. That's where I spend most of my time. So either send me a DM or if you want to just be a silent follower, I'd appreciate that. I also have a website, www.foodfreedomandfertility.com. And that's a great place to go if you want to just simply get more information about the services that I offer, who I am, what I do, um, and lots of information on Instagram too. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay. I so appreciate you being here. Absolutely. Thanks for having me today. Okay, everybody. I hope that you enjoyed that episode of the show. I know that I did. And if infertility is something that you're struggling with, my heart goes out to you and I am sending you so much love and strength to get you through this journey. And I hope that this podcast was helpful for you. And if it was, please definitely rate, review, subscribe to the show wherever you are listening or watching. It is the best way to support the show to help bring on amazing guests like Lindsay to just share all this information that more women need to know and that more people need to know, right? So please definitely do that and follow along over on Instagram at purely Pope and at the purely podcast. And as always, if you do leave a review, rate, review, subscribe, all that good stuff, you will automatically be entered to win a copy of my ebook leading with love and also a health coaching session with me. And remember that purely you is now launched, which is my subscription. It has Pilates, it has recipes, it has health coaching so much more. It is your one-stop shop for being the best version of you and just helping you get there. So definitely check that out. The link is in the show notes and I will see you next Thursday.